You may be seated. As we are now on uh, series three of love, um, we have looked into love as a as a virtue that is absolutely missing in, in our culture today. Uh, love is being able to give yourself, uh, give, give of yourself to someone else, your time, and also your emotions, and getting involved in their lives. Uh, but today it's not just a virtue. We're going to look at that love is an action word. It, it takes something that you, get, you have to come out of your, your comfort zone and to get involved in other people's lives. I mean, but the problem is that what we have is that we're so easily, we are so easily taken to a place of that I am mad at somebody that I'm not going to be a part of their lives. Kind of takes me back to when I was a kid. We used to play this game. It was called Slap Hands. How many of you ever played Slap Hands? Ever played Slap Hands? Some of you are looking like, I don't even know what Slap Hands is. All right, well, I'm going to tell you what it is, all right? You and your friend, or maybe it was a schoolmate that you went into because, again, it was a contest to see who was the, the quickest or even the strongest that, that you were say, I am the champion of Slap Hands. What you did was you, you took your hands and you put them down if you were the first one to go. And then your friend, he would be on the other side, and he put them on top, okay? So they're looking like this. The object of the game is to be able to touch their hands, okay? If you slap their hands, you get to do it again. You get to do it again. You get to do it again. And then all of a sudden they move. Now it's their turn. Now sometimes I've seen that it gets out of hand because a lot, what happens is, is that you have to move very fast. And in moving very fast, you're hitting hard. And so the back of your hand starts getting really red and starts getting really hurt. And I've seen some people just don't take that very well. And next thing you know, if they were friends, their friendship kind of inner, you know, kind of, there's a, there's a turmoil there. Well, you hurt me. You hurt. You hit hard. You know, I've heard those words come out of their mouths. Well, you hit me too hard. I'm like, well, move your hands. You know, and so in that we have been in life and got involved in people's lives and they have hurt us and now we have shut down and we're not loving anyone anymore. And so the action of love is no longer existing in our lives. And maybe it's because that, that even you yourself have been hurt so bad that you just say, you know, I just want somebody to love me. Well, it's going to take somebody to put some action. But right now this message is for you. For you to step out of your comfort zone of you to do something about it. That, that God is calling you to do that. And we're going to start off with a story in, uh, in Luke chapter 15. That it is a story of a different, I would say, is love and not the way we think it is. But it is definitely an action that is absolutely life changing. Because it involves bad people and good people. And a lot of people like to categorize themselves. So God just says, you know what, I'm going to put you all in the same pot. And I'm going to use this story to tell it. Jesus is the one who's going to be uh, telling this story. And it's, and it's starting off in Luke 15, verse 11. If you, if you have your Bibles, turn there to Luke 15 or your, or your iPhones, your apps. You go to Luke 15, verse 11. And we'll start off there. At verse 11 it says... And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of properties. With another version, it's an inheritance. Back in that day, it was unheard of that, you, that the father would give any part of his inheritance to his son until he was really at an age that he couldn't take care of the, the, uh, the facility of his land or his animals, then he would pass it down to his son so you know that the job would be taken care of. But until that time, the inheritance was held to either he got too old to take care of it or he died. And that's how it was. But now it's showing that the father is well and still good age, that the son is just being really straightforward and saying, I want my inheritance now. And that's what he's asking. He says, that is, he says, uh, Father, give me, my, give me the share of property that, that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them, him and his brother. So, he went and hired himself out to, whoops. I missed something here. There we go. Not many days later, the young son gathered all, his, all, all he had and took a journey into, the, into a far country. And there he squandered his properties in reckless living. 
And he went and he had spent everything and, and a severe famine arose in the country and he began to be in need. So he, he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country he sent, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods of the pigs that the, the pigs that ate. And no one gave him anything. But, but when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said, to his servant, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the fields, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked, asked what these things meant. He said to him, Your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf, and because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated and, and, and him. But he answered to his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your commandments, your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this your son came who was devoured, your, devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to, his, to, said to his, him, Son, you are always with me, and, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This, this message usually is brought in a way that is evangelistic way of saying you have wandered away and you've taken your, your, your life into a place that is just in a dark place. Because this son who had this inheritance ended up into a place because dealing with pigs in a Jewish culture was the lowest of lows. Because that was considered the unclean of unclean. And in that, for, for another Jewish father, the look that you've been dealing with pigs is saying, you're disgusting, I want to have no part of it. And in that, we have taken this, and it is a good sermon, but this is not the sermon that God wants to deliver to you. That, you know, in a way it is, yes, He wants you to come back to Him, and He'll accept you even though you've been with the lowest of low and you made bad choices but today it's the idea of those that are looking for love in all the wrong places and also it goes to those that are look that have been with God they go to church every Sunday they get up and read their Bibles every day those that pray that just all of a sudden something comes upon them and they look at a person coming into their church and they're seeing the favor of God on them and they got a bad attitude towards this brother or sister in Christ and that they're shunning them and not have, helping them in their journey it's the problem is that we're not focusing on how the father is treating the sons and in that it's, it's a lack of teaching because love is action. 
And in that, in our journey, we are in one shoe or the other. We are the son that has been with God for all our lives and never left him when we did good. Or we're the other son that has said, man, I just this ain't working out. I want to do things my way and I'm going to go my way. And you made a lot of bad choices. Now you're feeling condemned that there's no way you can even go back to God because of all the bad choices that you made. But they all lost focus on the father and how the father has lived his life and that taking that teaching that his father was giving him, giving them both, they were being selfish. And that's where we make a lot of bad choices. That we should take on what the father is doing and watching him and how he lived. That he is teaching us how to be and how to grow up. So in reality, as we're going through life, we're really immature little Christians. One way or another. I mean, I remember when, at, at, at the point in my life one day, and I looked and I said, you know, if that's what the church is all about, my friends are better friends, and we're out getting high and getting drunk, and they're better friends to me and our friends around us than the people who are in the church, because they just badmouth people. And I don't want no more of it. And I walked away. But I made a choice. But here's the thing about it. I was focused on me and what I wanted. Nobody taught me about the Father of saying, he is our, our imitator. He is the one that's saying we should follow him. But maybe they taught it, but it comes back to again. It's my immaturity. Our immaturity. How are we to tell others about God's love when we're so immature of Christians? Here's where I'm going at. Is that God has called us to a higher level and that we should be taking in how the father treated both sons. His one son messed up bad. And what did he do? He loved him. Hugged him. First thing he did was hug him. Then he put a robe on him. Put, the, put a ring saying he is a part of my family. Put shoes on his feet. And then fed him because he hadn't, been, he hadn't eaten anything in a long time. And then to his other son, who never left, who's always been a Christian, who's always been a part of the family, who's always been the church, who's always got involved, and who's always done give to the ministries that are better in need, and, and saw the pictures up on the screen of the, of the missionaries, and gave to that ministry, and has been a part of that. And he comes to him, and he pleads with him, and says, listen, you have always been with me. Why didn't you just ask? Because again, the scripture says, you don't get because you don't ask. You forget sometimes where you're at. You're so self-absorbed in, uh, in what's going on around you that we're losing the big picture. And here's where God is wanting us to go. He's wanting us to get to a point of that there are others out there that need to be taught how to love. And first, how can we teach them how to love if we haven't taught ourselves how to love? And, and maybe somebody is teaching us how to love, but we're just being so self-centered that we're not receiving the teaching and we're missing everything. And people are coming into our lives and out of our lives. And are going to die and miss Jesus. Because we are not loving them where they are in their life. Here's where I'm getting that from. We go to Ephesians. And I'm going to read this. In Ephesians chapter 4. Paul is talking to the Ephesians church. And he's telling them a thing that absolutely just sticks out into to what it is all about. I have looked into ministries and watched how they do things and I have even looked at myself and, and even judged myself at how I've treated people. I mean, I even was able to have a conversation with somebody yesterday and in that conversation I revert back to of when one time I was so on fire for God that I was quick to condemn them that they were in the wrong place and they had the wrong relationship with God and God was going to take everything from them. Might have been true, but how I delivered it was definitely wrong. Because it was not in love. It was con in con condemnation. It was condemning them. But I, I didn't learn that. I mean, I didn't learn to say it in love. I learned how to condemn. And that's why people do not want to have anything to do with churches. Because as soon as they walk into a church, whether they got holy jeans or a t-shirt or earrings or tattoos or just, uh, just the, their appearance of maybe they, they, they've been homeless for a while and they smell and, and they come into the church, the people automatically shun them. 
And Jesus is saying, now is the time of salvation. This person needs to be loved on where they are and what they're going through right now. And it's our job to know how to love them where they are. And we're failing. Because every day that the, that the time goes by, people are dying and missing heaven because they're, they have not repented, changed their mind about where they're going, and, and confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and asked forgiveness of their sins. And they're missing it. And we are supposed to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And in that, Jesus loved. He loved. He had every right to condemn. He had every right to be a judge. He had every right to tell the little woman that was brought to him before his feet and who was caught and having sex with a, a married man or she was married and had sex. It was an adulterous catch. Somebody caught him and that, that, that the law stated that she was supposed to be stoned to death. Jesus had every right to stand on the law and condemn her to death. But he didn't. He says, any of you that haven't sinned, go ahead and throw a stone. Kill her. Go ahead. But everybody realizes in their heart is that, shoot, far out, dude. I messed up just five minutes ago. And they dropped their rocks. And they walked away. And he knelt down to her and he looked at her and she's just like, hey, where are those that condemn you? She said, I don't know. He said, go. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Love. That woman's life was changed because he loved her right where she was. We need to be teaching that. But how can we, t not, how can we teach that if we haven't even received it? And I get it from this, this scripture. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. It's 11 through 16. And he gave, them, he gave the apostles, the prophets and the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers... To equip the saints, equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measures of the statures of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and, the, and, the, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, or by craftiness and deceit and schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ. For, for whom... The whole body joined and held together by every joint with, with which in which it is, in, is equipped when, when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds, into, it builds itself up into love. The only thing that's going to change the body of Christ is love. Again, I have seen people being at the altar, falling down, crying, because the message was a good message. It was true. But it was delivered in condemnation, not in love. They saw the picture of hell, and they didn't want to go to hell. But in that, their hearts was not changed, because I myself have experienced both hands. And what changed my heart was love. It changed my whole demeanor. Changed what come out of my mouth. It changed how I, I did things. And, and we're going to stumble through life. And we need each other there to help us. Help each other. And that's what the Father was showing. Listen, I am here. You went out. You made bad mistakes. And I stayed right here waiting for you. He was our example. Just as we should be the example. As those around us have go off and make mistakes. And, it, and because the, the question is, I, I've asked myself, why, I, I am, <sighs> truth. I'm here in this ministry, and I'm doing what God's called me to do. But there are people that go to other churches, they call me to come and consult with me, and they don't go to their own pastors. Why? 
Because I will love them like Jesus loved them. I don't know if it's true for the other pastors. I don't know. But I know who I am. And I know Jesus loved me when I was a ter terrible person. I was a bad person. I did evil things. And he loved me. And the people know my personality is just as Jesus loved me, I'm going to love them back. Even though they made a bad choice. And tears are falling down their eyes. And they're, they're just sitting there, just they're opening up. Because my question is, why did you come to me? I don't know. Well, all I got to say is, I'll be truthful with you. I'll tell you that you're wrong. But I'll love you. And it's up to you to change your mind. See, that was what the father was doing there. He was doing to the son that left. He's saying, listen, I, I've been here waiting for you. And now I see that you've changed your mind. That the way you were living was not good. And then he goes to the son. And he appeals to the son. The one who's been good. Because there's one, there are followers of Christ out there. They're frustrated. They're stuck in a place. They're, they're upset. And God's saying, I love you. And I have greater things for you to do to further the kingdom of my son Jesus. So get over yourself and grow up. That's what Ephesians is telling us. It's saying we should be mature Christians. We need to get out of the baby stage and quit saying, oh, and just ranting and raving as we do and just say, you know what? I'm going to give it to God and let him take care of that person and I'm going to love him. It's hard to do because that means you've got to get involved in their heart and their mess. Drama. Woo Drama. <laughs> He says, she said kind of stuff, or she says, she, well, that's more than one. She said, she said kind of stuff, but it's the idea of giving the advice. What would God tell them? Well, if you can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all. Because the idea of true love is treat somebody the way you want to be treated. It goes back to what you want to teach your kids. I mean, that's one of the greatest things of teaching the kids is to do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Do, love them. Don't be ugly to them. Don't hit. You know, and we're going off and, and, and doing the wrong. We're being the example. And we're, how can we teach our kids to love if we're not loving? And, and Paul is telling us, it's time to grow up. Because what I see I see the future is getting worse. The, prof the prophets of old and even Jesus' words of prof prophesying that things in this world is, is going to get worse. So it's time to grow up. It's time to love others no matter what. How do you think Paul felt being beat because of Jesus? Did he take it out on the guards? Ah, because you hit me. Bleh, you know, I'm going to badmouth you. No. He loved the guards. Even though he was just swelled up with wounds and everything else. How much more? Our life is not like that. But there's a pastor now that's in Iran. And he's being held because he was telling people about Jesus. And they beat the snot out of him. And he's in bad way. His health is in a bad way. And he's still loving God. And he's still telling people about Jesus. Because that's what's coming out of that prison. It's coming out that he's still telling them about Jesus. So it's time to love others. To love others. It's like this. Oops. When you love others, you're quick to forgive. The first action... To show your love is to forgive those you got something against or somebody's got against you. Walk in forgiveness. Because you have been forgiven of a lot of sin. You may think you're good. You're a goody two shoes. You've done nothing wrong. But all you had to do was tell one lie and you're standing in equal standings before God as a murderer. That's what matters. And, you've, and Jesus died on the cross to forgive you. So in that, forgive. 
His father forgave his sons. He forgave both his sons for being selfish and inconsiderate. And he's saying, it's time to grow up, boys. Today, today the message is for you. It's time to grow up. It's time to love others. To stand on his word in Matthew's words. It says, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And second, is to love others as you love yourself. So as we bow and pray, I ask you to search your heart. Do you have something against someone else? Are you an immature young Christian and the focus is on about, it's about you and you're mad at somebody? God's imploring you. He's just begging you. It's time to grow up. It's time to forgive them and it's time to love others. I know it's hard. Some people are just, they're just not nice people. But it's time to love them. Because if they die in that state, you won't see them in heaven. And for me, I want to see you and them in heaven. Because I want to see you come to me and, and, and introduce them to me and say, Hey, remember that time that you told me to grow up? Well, I took it seriously and I did it. And God used that to change their life and they got saved. And now they're in heaven. What will change a person's life is love. So I'm asking you, check your heart. Do you have love in your heart? If not, then ask Jesus to come in and reveal and take away any bitterness or anger. Talk to Him now. And just cover you with His love. And it will change your life. It will change your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank You for this Word. We thank You that You sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And even right now, we just ask, ask you, Jesus, uh, to, to come into our hearts and forgive us of our wrongdoings against you. We change our minds in the direction that we're going, and, and, and it, it's not the right way, and we want to go your way. And in that, you will just fill us with your Holy Spirit and take all the bad stuff out and put your love in us. That our family and our friends around us will, will come to know you as Savior, and that when we all say, Goodbye to this world. We'll be in heaven with you. Because you loved us first. So Holy Spirit move now. Move now and change our, change our hearts and draw us unto God. And Father I stand on your word. You said that if we lift up the name of Jesus. You will draw men unto you. God use these words to save souls. And further the kingdom of your son. For I love these people. Because you loved me first. You changed me. You sought me out. You hunted me down. You used people in my life to get to me. And I thank you for that. And you changed my heart because you love me. Go now and love. Love like never before. Let love rage into their lives, into the people that are hearing this. Let your love rage in their life. I bless them with your love this day. May this week they'll see you in many little things. Even just the little things of I lost my keys and you'll just take them right to their keys. And stuff like that. Reveal to them how much you love them. Be a, be a mighty father to them this week. I bless them with your love. In Jesus' name, amen.